So this was um, this chapter was basically about term frequency and IDF, and uh, I never appreciated the importance of this till I attended a talk by uh, Maini Setenkaya. She's um, she does a lot of work on uh, inferential statistics, etc., and she had um, talked about this in the context of analyzing uh, data, and I was just blown away by the applications of it because it's um, it's really a powerful, powerful algorithm to know. Mm -hmm. So the TF or the term frequency is as the words describe. It's basically sorry, how many? Yeah, sorry, sorry can, can you hear you me? Increase the screen size. <laughs> I don't take the notes. Okay, no problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is this good enough? Okay, yeah. right. Okay, so term frequency is as the words indicate. It's fre how frequently a word appears in a document. And that is something that we always know. It's like what we call as rate, et cetera. It, it goes by different um, terms. However, the IDF or what is the inverse document frequency, it's kind of neat because it decreases the weight for something that appears a large number of times, and it increases the weight for those which don't come as much. So it's kind of counterintuitive to how we think of as frequency, because frequency we think of as count, as occurrence count. And the IDF actually is a way where you uh, decrease the weight for common words and increase the weight for. So that way, when you multiply the two factors together, you actually get the frequency of a term adjusted for how rarely it's been used. So in other words, it's going to pick up on the ones which are, um, and I think it, it kind of avoids the outliers, the ones which show up a lot and the ones that don't show up at all. And it kind of manages to find that sweet spot right in the middle. And you'll see that in a little uh, graph uh, further down. But um, in any case, they are using any questions at this point, because this is like really the whole chapter, like EFIDF. So it sounds like uh, some military term, but that's what it is. Um, so uh, the same players involved, um, your deep player, they are using the works of uh, Jane Austen here. And it's uh, in this like, very neat library called Jane Austen R. And I have a few other libraries that I've included here. So the first thing that we are doing is that we are pulling in Austen underscore books is literally um, just a collection of um, 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 Shamsuddin. Are you able to see my art studio? Yes, yes. So our Austin underscore books is oh, sorry, it's actually a function. So it's really kind of neat. They have tokenized every word in this. So I'm not sure I would call it word, but they have it broken up by some grain. And I don't quite know what the grain is, but if you um, do, um, let's say if you do view of, uh, I guess you can't use it because of the fact, what it, it's probably returning a, a table, so I think um glimpse no actually glimpse it's, doesn't it's just the view needs to be capitalized oh is it capitalized yeah oh. and I, I was reading the book earlier today and it's broken up by line so what those are are uh oh these are rows. lines oh yeah each row is, uh -huh. well thank you that's good to know okay so i that makes perfect sense because i could not when I was writing this, I just could not figure out what it was. Okay, got it. So I guess that's what it looks like. It is. It's, it's by each line of the book, and it's um, okay. That makes sense. Well, thank you for uh, saying that. So that's how the this particular Austin underscore books has been organized, and you can imagine like what a great work that is because now it really opens up. Um, you know, all kinds of possibilities. So here they then do an unnest tokens, which basically means that you are going to be using, uh, you're unnesting it by word. So apparently you can unnest it by letter, you can unnest it by character or m multiple uh, ways to break up your line. In this particular case, they're doing it by word. So text would be a column. I believe text is a column in the, let's go back here. Um, yeah, so text is the, this first column, which had each line, and then you, it literally has two columns, the column text and the column book, which has the name of the book. 
And so they have broken up the column text by word. And then um, you're, you're doing something like a frequency count here where you're getting a count of um, all the, the words and you're sorting it by true. So ignore the warnings. I should have actually um, um, suppressed them. But anyway, so this is what you get here. For the group by, which is by the book, you can see that you're getting the word count and you get the total the total number of words in that particular uh, book. So you're getting N, which is the count of the let of the word the in the total number of words, which is uh, 160,000. And you get it for each, um, and it's sorted by N. And so that's why it's kind of mixed up with different books there. So, so that's what this has done. You, you have summarize here, which has given you the, the total, which is a total number of uh, words. And then you have your count of each, uh, each word, right? So you can see that as can be expected, all of these, you know, stop words as they're called are like the highest count here. And then, so that's something we have to figure out how, how we can get around that. So this is just a straight graph that just shows you what the distribution looks like. And you can see that it's got a huge, huge tail which supposedly in this business is very common. You have the ones which show up and they're really small in number, but the ones that don't show up or whose numbers are really small are like, that's where the tail is. So it's a heavily skewed graph with, you know, a really long tail. So any questions here or any comments? Well, this is basically just plotting your N over total. So this is, um, N over total is actually the opposite. So if you remember the, the, what ID, um, actually, I guess I did not, uh, oh, I made a mistake. Let me go back to the book. Here is where you can actually see what the uh, formula looks like. It's a number of documents over the number of documents that actually contain the term, and then you have the natural log of that. So that's how the IDF term is. It's, it's, it's a natural log of this particular um, formula. So what you're seeing here is, basically just um, N over, where is that? Um, N over total. So you're not seeing any formula represented here. It's not a log, it's not a natural log or whatever. It's just a ratio, N over total. So you're not really calculating the IDF there in case you're wondering. But here, then they go on to actually do, so you know how it is, right? When, when a graph is skewed or it looks really bizarre, like we saw this during the COVID uh, era where, you know, the, the graphs were like all over the place because we didn't understand what an exponential term was. When you have graphs which are this skewed, you always want to do a log or a natural log because then it, it, it brings up things which are not um, as easily visible as they are right here. So this particular aspect where you have a really long tail is uh, apparently goes by the name of Zipf's law, Zipf's law, whatever. It's, um, it's called, so here what it says is that the frequency of a word the frequency that a word appears is inversely proportional to its rank. So in other words, the more that a word appears, the less it is ranked. And less that a word um, appears, it has a higher rank. And that's exactly what you want to see because you can see how you have missed like, the entire forest here by not counting what words these are just because they have um, such a low occurrence. So what he does here is then he determines the rank based on uh, exactly what they're talking about here. And he is ordering it by um, in, a, in a descending manner. And then you, pl and you plot it here on the graph. And what you see is that you have the two ends kind of look like they're a little bit different, but this part here is, is really consistent, right? So there is this region here where they are literally on top of each other. Like the lines are all, all they're all on top of, the other. So what does this mean exactly? Basically, what it is telling you is that in this region where you have so much of commonality, this is where you can expect to see the maximum number of words where um, they don't fall either into the ones which are expressed the most or the ones which are expressed the least, but they are the ones which likely are the ones of most importance. So here you can see they have filtered rank less than 500. Now, because this is a log scale, it's not going to, I mean, this is obviously not 500. It's, it's definitely, uh, you know, um, 
uh, spaced differently. Um, you're basically selecting everything that's above rank 10 and anything that's less than 500. I'm not quite sure where 500 would fall. I'm guessing like somewhere here or something like that, but it would be this region. And they're going to try and draw a linear uh, regression to see what uh, you know how closely those are following along, and this has been converted into a log ten scale here. So this is um, a log ten for on both sides, your rank and your uh, frequency. So when they do that, what they find is that it's a, it's a negative. So in other words, it's it's actually going down. So in other words, when something is expressed more or has a greater frequency, it tends to be ranked lower, right? So that's why it's uh, it's a negative slope. And you can see that right here, you're having almost a straight slope. I mean, like your slope is almost one or negative one, sorry, which means that this is like they're perfectly correlated. The fact that your frequency is uh, um, one E minus, is that minus? That's minus five, right? Hold on, I'm confused right now. This would be a minus zero two, correct? So you're actually going higher in number. Yeah, so the frequency is increasing here. Right, because this is actually minus two, minus three, so it's going up. So that's right. So as your frequency goes up, you find that your um, rank. Huh? Is that opposite of what I just said? Wait, I think I said something opposite. The frequency that a word appears is inversely proportional to its rank. So in other words, the less. Wait, frequency. So this is a lower frequency, yeah. That's a, a, a higher, higher. This point. is a higher frequency, higher Red. frequency, but the rank uh -huh. is lower. Okay, yeah, that's right. Because the rank is going up. Yeah, that's right. So this is a, uh, yeah, this is a higher frequency and it's a lower rank. Okay, yeah, sorry, brain freeze. Rank is one. The higher the frequency, the lower the rank. The lower the rank. Okay, that's right. So, and your rank gets higher when your frequency actually becomes uh, lesser, correct? Yeah, okay, all right, that makes sense. So, and that's what the text is saying that you're, it's, it's an inverse relationship right there. So when they plot the LM, you can see that this is almost like a straight uh, linear regression uh, slope. And so then they use this function, which is found in the tidy text package. And what they wanna do is they want to tokenize um, each word or, sentence. So you can do it either by sentence, by character, by letter, or in this case, we are doing it by word. And you can do it per document. And your document can either be uh, everything in that. It could be a whole collection or a corpus of documents, or it could be a single document. And I think typically this is used with like a large bunch of documents. So in this case, they're using the entire um, book. So in other words, we are looking at the number of times word appears here in the book, which contains all the documents, which is the last necessary column. And then you have N, which is gonna give you the count. So this is gonna bind each word across the entire corpus of documents or the entire collection of books. So if you look at this now, you see how you have the same token here again. You have N, which for Mansfield, 6206160460, as we saw earlier, um, 6201640, but now you will see two additional columns which indicate the, the term frequency and then the IDF and then this which match which uh, multiplies those two terms and gives you a TF IDF which is the one that we are uh, going to be using. Um, and so here you see that what we end up with is when you order it inversely. So you, you get all of these, you get 40,000 um, rows for each one of those. Since you're tokenizing it by word uh, and you're doing it across all the books, you get this count, but now we wanna see what are the highest players in this. So when you do it arranged by descending, you can see that in sense and sensibility that the name, for example, all of these are unique to the book. So then this one becomes the highest. Marianne here is the highest Crawford. All of these are like proper nouns. So proper nouns are showing up as having the highest um, uh, IDF here, right? So I'm not sure if this uh, makes sense. Is, are there any questions? Yeah, so what about the, um, which 
TF IDF, is it the Imbus, right? So what the Imbus is telling us now, the last column. The last one, right? Yes. So this is the important one, the IDF, right? Because uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So here you said the um, IDF. Here we have like these important characters in the book, which yeah. are maybe mentioned. Um, yeah. So I think this makes sense. But I'm trying to understand the TF. Uh, the last column, um, what is really... Um, Let's see, what is the TF-IDF here? Uh -huh. oh, the TF-IDF. So it's to find the important words for the content of each document by decreasing the weight of commonly used words and increasing the weight for words that are not, not used very much. So let's do that now as an input. And in this example. So my, the way that I understand it is just that the rightmost column, TF IDF, is just the result of multiplying TF and IDF. And so you see that um, the, the words that were the highest, which are the, to, and, uh -huh, they all have IDFs of zero. So that's why the third column is zero. So they get no weight, basically, because they're omnipresent throughout all of those books. And then... That's a good point. Um, Whereas here you have, these have a higher PF IDF. Uh -huh. uh, and it's because their IDF is so high. Their IDF, instead of being zero, is 1.79, for example, for the first five or six. Even though it's only 623 relative to 6,000, like literally it's a tenfold difference between the and, I mean, it's not the same book, but even then, you know what I mean? Ah, uh, okay. So it is. The last column that we are talking about is the one that is showing us the most important word in the document, right? It's not yes. the IDF. Yeah, exactly. That's what uh, that's what Justin just said. Yeah, that's yeah. correct. Yeah. Okay, it's that not makes the sense. IDF. Yes, yeah, it's TF IDF. That's exactly right. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. The most document frequency is very low for words that occur in many. Right. So. What is the use case for this? So if given a document, we want to find some important maybe words, um, the use case. Um, IDF, it's a natural log. All right, okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, and so then when they actually visualize this on, uh, uh, on a decrementing scale, you can see that here in this, you have um, a much higher TFDF, a TFIDF for the ones mm -hmm. which, um, okay, so that makes sense, okay. And, uh, got it. So TF idea find in, uh, words that are common, but not too common. Yeah, exactly. It seems to pick that linear region, which is not either at the top or at the bottom. Like it's, it's like right about here. Okay. Yeah. So, and that's the part where you see that you have the maximum like overlap anyway. So it's, it's, it's really kind of cool, actually, that formula managed to pick that area. Hmm. Nice. Right. That's a lot.
log pen scale. So, okay. So you still have all the proper nouns that show up in the books, but then I guess it's, um, it's the most important to each novel. Um, it shows us that Jane Austen used similar language across all her six novels and what distinguishes one novel from the rest are the proper nouns or the names of peoples and, uh, people and places. This is the point of TFIDF. It identifies words that are important to one document within a collection of documents. So in other words, I feel like the one thing that we, that is not really stressed here is that it's not important. It's not that these words are important only in the sense of, in, in, in sense and sensibility. It's comparing it across the entire corpus of documents. Mm. And it's picking up the ones which relative to all, because I think if you did, the, did this only in the, in the context of sense and sensibility, it may not look the same because it would be pretty important in that book alone. But when you compare it across a corpus of documents, I think it tends to wait, like it's some sort of a weighting almost that you are measuring that across a larger, almost a data set or a larger sample set. And it seems to be picking up things which are not that important, but then which are, um, you know, higher than. Uh, the other. So I think that's like an important distinction, which I had to read uh, several times. It's, it's identifies words that are important to one document within a collection of documents. Okay. Right. So like that's, I think that's like an important thing to know there. Mm. So uh, this part, I didn't actually include in my presentation, like I stopped it here, um, but I think they have some other things here where they are looking at other books and they are trying to, um, you know, come up with uh, like a similar uh, analysis where they uh, again sorted by word and, and here they come across the words are like, you know, in these are the four books that they are by the four authors whose books they are looking at. Um, Galileo, and then Huygens, uh, Tesla, and Albert Einstein, and they are again to, uh, unnesting it based on uh, word, and and then they again do this bind IDF uh, where they have I guess they've created this they made this into factors. Oh, sorry, excuse me. They made that into they factorized the names, and then do, done the same thing where they reordered that and then done the the bind underscore uh, TF, IDF, and this is what they found. Here they found that there's a lot of weird characters here, especially for the guy who's doing um, um, a lot of this refraction stuff here. So then they do an anti-join with the stop list, which they define. They define a stop list here, did an anti-join, um, and then come back and do the same analysis again. And then what, what they found here is is this this is what they get? Um, I guess the x-axes are not the same for each one of these faceted graphs. It's uh, water refraction zero point zero 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 point zero zero. I mean, they are relatively similar, though. Interestingly, they are all pretty similar. Relativity. One thing we can conclude is that we don't hear enough about ramparts or things being ethereal in physics today. So I don't know where the ramparts. Oh, so like right here, terminal button, Galilean relative. So that's interesting. We have the TFIDF and so that's kind of, I mean, I'm not sure I know exactly the, the reason why TF-IDF works that well, I think it has to do with the logarithmic nature of reporting the IDF, right? Like I think it's the more that something is, it's um, what is it? the natural, the log of one is zero, correct? And the log of zero is one, right? Or the natural log, or am I forgetting? Yeah, yeah. So what happens is that when something is extremely overexpressed, then you get closer to zero, which is why the log is giving you a negative thing. And the closer you are to, a lower value, you actually get something because a log of something closer um, uh, between zero and one, you will you will you will increase in value. But then I mean, log of one or is is a zero, right? So the clo the higher you are, you, the closer you are to the higher end of that. Um, I, and IDF is nothing but a rate or a frequency, so it's probably expressed in that range, isn't it? Like zero to one, I think. 
because that's what it said here. Now it kind of makes sense as to why this works because of the fact that, um, because I think, um, what is it? Uh, I think I just saw that um, here somewhere. It didn't make sense then, but it does now. Um, yeah. Notice that IDF and thus TF, IDF are nearly zero for these common words. Why? Because they appear in all six. So the IDF term, which is going to be close to one, right? Because remember how IDF is computed. It's a number of documents. Do you remember the formula for IDF, right? It was number of documents over the number of documents containing the term. So if a lot of the documents have it, then it becomes six over six, which will give you close to one. And the log of one is going to be zero. Whereas if you have it in lesser number of books, that means you won't have six over six. You may have six over one or something like that, which means you would have to find the log of something like um, six. Wait. These are all words that appear in all six of Jane Austen's novels. So it will be a natural log of one, which is going to be zero. So that's something that's really common. But the inverse document frequency is very near zero for, that, for, for something that occurs because you're multiplying it by zero. You're multiplying the TF into IDF by something approaching zero. So that's why your TF IDF gives you a, a low value for the common ones. Whereas for the ones which are not there, then it's the opposite effect. Because when you put it here in the number of documents over the number of documents that contain the term, if it's in lesser number of documents, instead of six over six, it might be six over one document, then it's six. What is the log of uh, six relative to the log of um, one? What is the log of six? I don't remember. Let's try it and see what you get. Log of six. It's zero point seven seven. So it's it's close to one, but it's not there. And whereas a log of one would be zero. You see what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the higher it ap appears in anything, you would have to compute the log of something. Log of one is zero. So that means that okay. So I guess here in this case, the the log term is basically dictating how your it's kind of like a weighting almost, right? That's what that's what it is. It's kind of and like an exponential axis or an exponential scale. Does that make sense? Or am I totally off yeah. base here? Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. Well, the, are you cool with that, just Justin, right? Yeah, Justin. Uh, yes, I'm I'm cool with that. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, so that's all I had. Um, so I had you know, I um I've never actually wondered, I've never known how this thing works. So I was kind of happy to read it. And I think talking to you guys, it, uh, many things that I thought I knew, I, which I didn't make sense now. So glad I could get that sorted out. Cool, cool. I mean, I mean that's one of the essence of the book club. Book club right? Yeah. Actually, you can, <laughs> you you can you, get things yeah. figured out, right? Yeah, so if you opt to present a chapter, you try to read it and understand yeah. And it will stick more than just being passive member of the group. And I, I totally, the, yeah, yeah. That's the main idea. Well, the next one is a pretty big one. I'm wondering who's going to present that because that's a, that's a really good one. I've attended a talk on this and it's, it's really interesting stuff. So curious yeah. to see who would present that. But Right. Okay. Um, anyways, this is all I have now. Um, I'm going to have to drop off because I actually have a call at 345 with a client. So ah, okay. Thank I'm you. gonna jump off, but um, thank you so much. Sorry, I thank haven't you, been attending. That. I but okay. this is like my busy time of the day. So um, all right, thank you all. Thank you for joining, and thank you, um, Justin. See you all next week. Bye bye. Yes, yes. Bye. 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 bye.